bombs. But uh, nevertheless, they loved playing around with bombs. So this was a way of having your cake and eating it too, that uh, you could play around with bombs and still not be killing people, but exploring the, the universe. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. It's one thing to theorize. It's another thing to hear a countdown off a loudspeaker and put on some dark glasses and then all of a sudden to see this pow turn into a pow and rattle and actually break martini glasses that were that were on the uh, shelves of the beach house that was used by the scientists that were there at the end of the day to have their martinis. The Orion spaceship would ride on a wave of atomic explosions, each generating for an instant temperatures many times hotter than the surface of the sun. The original reaction always was, that's absurd. And Ted then told a little story about the tower in New Mexico where they exploded the very first bomb. That tower was, I think, 200 feet high, and on top of it there was the bomb. And you saw the pictures then afterwards of the fireball of the bomb completely enveloping the tower. Everybody had the idea that since the bomb exploded on the tower, the whole tower was vaporized, there was nothing left. Well, what Ted actually did was he went to the test site, he looked for the pieces of the tower, and he found they were all still there. That every piece of that tower actually is still lying there in the desert. They were thrown considerable distances but they were not vaporized. Tests with high explosive showed that a bomb could push a model Orion without destroying it. This rare film was taken at the Point Loma Naval Test Range by Orion team member Jerry Astle. George Dyson learned that Astle was still living in nearby Solana Beach and that he'd kept Orion relics. Jerry Astle had been recruited by Ted Taylor for his knowledge of explosives. Astle was a Czech resistance fighter specializing in sabotage. Now this is the first model of Project Orion ever built. Astle's experiments simulated the impact of nuclear bombs by detonating half-pound balls of plastic explosive suspended below a steel base plate. This model, or the overgrown fat bullet, was actually what we anticipated first our prototype will look like. And we were trying to learn from it what are the pressures alongside the envelope, which will tell us to what kind of loads we have to design that envelope. We were testing shock absorber. What kind of damage will it suffer? And we made many shots, we made many tests, and to everybody's surprise, it didn't look bad at all. It looked like, indeed, you can design structure very easily, which will take all the loads. But the ship is then going to be hit by the debris from this bomb, which is plasma traveling at approximately 300,000 miles an hour. The ship's going to be hit by that. You have to you do that by having a pusher plate, which absorbs the impact from that blast. Then this 1,000 ton steel plate is instantly accelerated to about 1,000 Gs, 1,000 times the acceleration of gravity. Now your challenge becomes, how do you put some kind of shock absorbers between the ship and this plate? It turns out, uh, to everyone's surprise, that when you subject a large plate behind which there is a shock absorbing system to a bomb explosion, 
that the plate absorbs the bomb materials and is accelerated. The shock absorber moderates that acceleration. And the final product of this is a, an acceleration which, very surprisingly to many people, a human being can tolerate. The momentum that's given to the ship comes in jerks. And so the problem then is how big a jerk can you actually give to a ship without destroying it? And, and that's really the limiting factor for this whole business. You have to calculate what sort of a jerk you can take. So something like 10 meters a second or 30 miles an hour is about the limit. If, uh, each bomb can only move you 10 meters a second in, in terms of velocity change. To get into orbit, you need about 10 kilometers per second. So it means you need about a thousand bombs. The key calculation in the Orion project was what would happen to the steel pusher plate when exposed to intense heat and radiation from thousands of nuclear explosions. As the plasma, which is moving you know, at this 300,000 miles an hour and it's at a temperature of about 100,000 or 10,000 degrees, when it hits the plate and s stagnates, slows down, it it heats up, suddenly heats up to this burst of temperatures of the order of 100,000 degrees. What does that do to the steel surface? So the plate will certainly lose a certain amount of material each time, and everything depends on how much. So there's where you have to have mathematics, you have to calculate. And so if it was, if, 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 if it would remove a thousandth of an inch each time, then we'd know we'd be in very good shape. In 2,000 bombs, you'd, only, you'd lose only two inches. But if it lost a hundredth of an inch each time, then you'd lose 20 inches, and that meant you're probably in very bad shape. The bomb debris is a, a very high temperature fluid, which is banging up against the bottom of the ship. So you have to do the hydrodynamics of this flow you have to do the radiation flow into the solid material. You have to do the evaporation of the material. It was just a whole lot of problems of the kind that I'm good at, the sort of practical problems involving mathematics. In watching Freeman work, I was always impressed that he never seemed to cross anything out. He would just sit there and write this, this, these, these things, just one after the other, like you're writing to your mother. I, I, it was just like calligraphy. And I don't know if he ever made mistakes. The theoretical calculations established that the pusher plate would in fact survive. At the test range, the model experiments became more sophisticated, using multiple explosive charges. Freeman Dyson liked to watch. To actually see him out there hanging out with these guys playing with high explosives. They could have 400 pounds of C4 without any uh, particular adult supervision. After the flights were over, I picked up these chips from the ground just to keep them as souvenirs. So these are, in fact, the genuine Orion chips. These are just parts of the canister in which the high explosive was contained that blew up. The canister was only needed to hold the high explosive. It didn't play any part in the propelling the ship. And we were lucky that we never got hit by any of these. There is a kind of scientist which I think I belong to, which loves inventing things and then playing around with inventions. And they are very often crazy. I mean, the mad scientist is not just a figure of speech. There really are such people. And they love to f play around with crazy uh, schemes. And some of them may even be dangerous. And, and so, I mean, the public is not altogether wrong in being a little bit scared of such people. No.